You what? It's just two fakes and four minutes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you're on. Yes, I think. So, good morning, comrades. My apologies that I couldn't be with you yesterday. I, I started driving my car here from Vitz and Pula Tata. I've never seen rain like this before. I managed to get from Vitz to Hillbrow, and by that time, the whole of the middle of Johannesburg was like an ocean. So I just couldn't come any further, and I had to turn back. So I'd like to thank Rick particularly for allowing me to speak with you today and uh, for giving me 20 minutes to do so. That does mean, however, my presentation is going to be shorter than the one I had planned, and so I will move through some things more quickly than others. But if there is something that you want to ask about, we can go back to that when we ask questions. So today I'm going to talk about um, how the expansion of mining into the former homeland areas has been leading to new processes of the enclosure or the privatisation of what was once communal land and still in some ways is, and how this has mainly been to the benefit of chiefs and at the expense of the ordinary people who live on and work that land. And I'll be talking about that in relation to the case of the platinum mining industry, which is the industry that I've been working on over the years. And we'll briefly move forward about how the, the spatial location of mining has changed in the new South Africa. But the real thing I want to concentrate on is how we think about mining as an industry in relation to land and in relation to land owners and how that affects how mining operates as an industry. I'll quickly then move into how the old mineral system used to facilitate the movement of mining into the homelands in certain respects. But the thing I'll really focus on at the end is how the ANC's minerals reform, the Minerals Petroleum Resources Development Act of 2002, how that has further facilitated the movement of mining into rural areas broadly at the price of the people who are living at the land and the way in which this has opened up new opportunities for chiefs to make money to accumulate from mining. So that's basically what I'll take us through um, in this presentation. So to move quickly, as you, will have, as you will have discussed in the days up to now, under apartheid, the way that South Africa was racially divided between the so-called homelands and the majority of white South Africa, this was actually a model which underpinned the mining industry as a whole in which the, the homeland areas were meant to act as labour reserves for the mining industry. So the pattern of those black arrows would have been that the mine workers and other forms of migrant labour would have been moving out of the homeland areas into the, what was designated as the industrial and the urban and the mining centres within white South Africa where the wealth, where the wealth was created and where it stayed, and that was basically the spatial division. However, in recent years, and particularly since 1994, with the end of apartheid, we've seen a very, very important shift, where within, within the within white, traditional mining areas of white South Africa, those are getting exhausted, the gold is gone, the coal is going on the VIP bank, the mining companies are searching for new reserves and new resources, and they're increasingly finding those within the former homeland area. So, under apartheid, labour flowed into, if you like, white South Africa. After apartheid, capital is now flowing into those areas which were historically designated as black South Africa. And as mining capital moves into these areas, it confronts and it encounters the forms of land, of communal tenure, and of political authority, tribal authority, which historically underpinned the operation of the migrant labour system. So this is a massive shift within the structure of the mining industry within South Africa, and the former homeland areas are now being reconstituted as the new frontiers of mineral capitalism. Okay, this, this is really exemplified by the case of the platinum mining industry but I'm not really going to go into it here but just to save time, other than to say 
that the majority of the world's platinum reserves are concentrated within South Africa, and historically those reserves were mainly found in Bo what was then Bofi, Botswana, and Laboa. So the western limb of the platinum belt rose within Bofi, Botswana, and the northern and eastern limbs of the platinum belt mainly rose within Laboa. <laughs> so what this means then is that with the um, there's been a massive increase in, in global platinum prices from, from the late 1990s. There was a huge expansion of the platinum mining industry, and that expansion happened within those areas, the former BOP and the former Laboa. That's where mining capital was developing new sites and moving rapidly over land. So basically, under apartheid, there was something like just four major platinum mines. They were concentrated around Rustenburg. Now, by 2010, there were something like 46 new mines and projects. And the majority of those projects and the majority of those mines were happening in the rural areas, which were previously defined as Botswana Swana and Laboa. But this is a story that we can also tell in the vendor with coal, that we can tell in Kolo Bene with the, with, with the titanium sands, and that we can tell in KwaZulu and Atel also with coal. So this is a growing trend throughout South Africa as a whole but I'm just using here platinum to illustrate it. Okay, I went through that fast because really what I want to get into is how we begin to understand and how we begin to analyze the way in which mining companies, mining capital is moving into the rural areas and actually finding land which is owned by other people. How do we begin to theorize that? How do we begin to think about its effects? And, and as a starting point, I'd like to suggest that we think of mining just like any other capitalist enterprise. So ultimately, mining, just like car manufacturing or making shoes or anything else, rests on the exploitation of labor. That's the starting point. And that's the photograph that I took at the Impala Mines uh, of a mine worker underground. So the exploitation of labor and at the other side, I hope you like the picture, the exploitation of labor by the capitalists. That's essentially the relation in mining as it is in other industries. It's an industry which is about making profits through the exploitation of labor. So it's like any other. But at the same time, there's a significant difference with, say, manufacturing. Because mining is a land-based industry. Mining happens on the land, and it involves the removal of the land. Agriculture is also a land-based industry, but there's a big difference between them. If you are a farmer and you have a field, then you can use that field again and again and again if you look after that field well. But if you are a mining company, if you are a mining corporation, you are digging a mineral out of the ground. And once that mineral has been removed, you have to move somewhere else. In other words, this is an industry which has to keep on moving. It has to keep on expanding because it's dealing with a finite resource. So mining then is an industry which can never stay still. And that in turn means that the, the, the mining bosses are always looking for new places to mine. They're going to keep on expanding and they're going to keep on expanding over the land. So existing mines are going to get bigger and when they're exhausted, the mining is going to move to, move to new places. In each time, it means there is a confrontation with the land because, in many, many cases, that land is owned by somebody else. That land is the property of somebody else, which is not the mining company. So suddenly, the mining company, its, its ability to expand over land, comes up against a barrier or a potential barrier, the barrier of the landowner. So this then means that the, mining, that the mining company, if it's actually going to get into production, has to negotiate access to that property. It has to negotiate access with another party to get onto that land for the purposes of mining. And that negotiation will usually involve a lease which, to which will be attached a payment, a payment of rent for the mining company to have temporary rights in that land, maybe on a 25 or a 30 year lease, so that it can then establish its own setup there 
and for the duration of that lease, that land will then be controlled by the mining company, as, as will the ground underneath it. So here, in fact, is a photograph taken from the Buffer King area from Still Drift. This area is designated for mining use only, no squatting beyond this point. Okay, so to get to this point, the mining company had to negotiate with someone because that land belonged to somebody else. So then the critical question is, who is that someone that the mining company has to negotiate with? And how strong are the property rights of the someone that the mining company has to negotiate with? Because from the perspective of the mining company, if the property rights are strong, if you have a strong wall or you have a strong fence, then that means that it's not easy for mining to expand. It has to do that negotiation. And if your rights are very strong, if your fence or your wall is very strong, then you're in a strong position where you can charge a good amount of money to that mining company to use your land and to use that resource. In other words, a high rent. And for the mining company, this is a problem because the money that you pay the rent is a deduction on its profit. It's losing money. It doesn't want to give money to landowners. But if your rights are strong, that's what you can make it do. And if your rights are very strong, you can say, we don't want mining here at all if you don't want mining. So that means then that it's within the interest of the mining company to weaken those rights, to not have a strong wall, to not have a strong fence, but to have the weakest barrier possible so it can, can gain access to the land and it can gain access to the resource at the least possible cost. So what this means is where mining is expanding, it is confronting landowners and depending on the strength of their property rights, there will often be a struggle between them over how mining accesses the land and on what, on, under what conditions it does so. And this is just a general way of thinking about mining and land as a starting point. And finally, one last point I'd like to make here is from the perspective of mining as well. If you have to deal with a landowner, it's much easier to deal with one large landlord because if Rick is the landlord, I only have to speak with him and I do the deal with him, and then I get the access to 30,000 hectares of land, and I get my rights in it, and I can mine it as I want. But imagine where you have, say, a, 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 um, a, an area under communal tenure, where you have many people who claim to have rights in that land. Then suddenly you're having potentially to negotiate with many small property holders, all of whom have a right to demand a share from you. The mining companies are always going to be looking to ways to reconfigure property relations. Number one, so that they're weaker, but also number two, so that land is consolidated within the biggest possible blocks, because this is what facilitates access, this is what facilitates accumulation, and this is what facilitates the maximum profitability of mining. So that just sets it up for you in the abstract. Now let's move to the concrete. And Rick, I'm t I've got 10 minutes, okay. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to move through very quickly how the system works under apartheid. But I think really we need to think of it more, more post-apartheid. And then, that will be, that then the intricacies of that can be taken up with Hank when he talks about the NPRDA. So during the apartheid era, there was a minerals regime throughout the whole of South Africa, which basically turned on two key differences. Number one, it drew a distinction between surface rights and mineral rights. And sometimes the same person could own both. So you could own the surface of the land, but also when you bought that land, the mineral rights were attached to it. So if the mining company wanted to mine it, it would have to come to you. It would have to negotiate a surface lease, a surface rent, and it would also have to negotiate a minerals lease for the minerals. And, and the form of rent for minerals is called a royalty. But also sometimes they were separated, so it actually becomes quite complex. But that's just a starting point. And then another key distinction within the apartheid minerals regime, and Hank can talk about this much better than me, was that within so-called white South Africa, the rights of private landowners 
were very, very strong, or relatively strong, vis-a-vis -vis mining companies. They could actually demand large royalties and rent. Why? Because their property rights were strong. They were the ones with the brick wall around their property, which the mining company had to get through. But within the areas which were defined as homelands, which were defined as fancy stands, the property rights were very weak, and they were generally grouped together as group rights, not as rights of individuals, and ultimately at some level controlled by the state. So this then meant that when mining companies moved into these areas, they would generally be negotiating with the state. And in the Bantustans like Bopu Tswana and the Boa, that would be the homeland state. Nevertheless, within those two Bantustans of Bopu Tswana and the Boa, there were also differences within different property regimes. And I really don't feel here that I've got the time to go through those, Rick, but I think we can come, can come back to them. But the, the key point I, I would like to make is the variations between the regimes were important because they gave different actors different degrees of rights and therefore the possibility of different actors to realise the rent. But ultimately, at the end of the day, all of this land was under the control of state. And what this meant was that the barrier for mining capital, white monopoly capital, to enter the black homelands to mine was, was a very porous one. It had a great big hole in it. And if indeed anybody like a local chief or whoever else began to agitate for their rights vis-à-vis -vis the mining company, then the homeland dictator would be there to suppress them and ensure that the royalties and the rents and were as low as possible and the access to the mining company was as easy as possible. And a good example of that was the struggle between the Impala Platinum Mining Company and the Buffer King Chieftaincy, where Lucas Mangopi, the dictator of Buffett Tuswana, intervened on the side of the mining company to suppress the rights of the Buffer King Tribal Authority. But it's an example we can come back to. So that was, that was the old system. And that operated all the way into the new South Africa. However, by the time of the, of the first democratic elections in 1994, the ANC, in its election manifesto, had already made clear that it now had a commitment to have a completely new and universal minerals regime throughout South Africa, which would not be based on the private ownership of mineral rights, whether by individuals or corporate bodies, but by the state itself. In other words, although it didn't want to use the word, it was going to nationalise mineral rights. And in some ways, this looked like a very, very progressive measure from what went before. The mining houses were completely opposed to it because they'd managed to sew up all of their rights through the deals they'd done with different parties beforehand in ways which were favourable to them. But at the same time, the ANC made it clear that it was nationalising mineral rights, but it was not going to nationalise the mining industry. And in fact, the reason why it was going to nationalise mineral rights was because <coughs> Remember what I said at the, near the beginning. It's far easier for a mining company to deal with one big landlord than lots of small ones. And in this case, the state would become the big minerals landlord of the whole of South Africa. So the mining companies actually would have a one-stop shop. There was just one body they would need to go to. They could get their rights, and then they could mine anywhere within South Africa. So this was actually to rationalise the mining industry and to accelerate the growth of the mining industry, not to, not to slow it down. But in addition to that, what eventually became the Minerals and Petroleum Resources Development Act of 2002, the MPRDA, which is what encapsulated this in, 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 in the legislation, also had other objectives. It wanted to nationalise rights in, in order to rationalise access to mining companies to make it easier, to eliminate the barrier of landed property, in other words, at the level of mineral rights, but also, at the same time, it wanted to bring about certain social and political objectives under the heading of transformation. And the most important of these we all know about was the promotion of so-called black, black economic empowerment. And really, despite the rhetoric, the ANC read black economic empowerment in the mining industry within a very narrow way and that was the deracialization of ownership of the mining industry. In other words, it wanted to use this legislation and the new mechanisms and the levers that it created 
to make the spaces for the Patras Motsapis, for his Bridget, for his sister Bridget, for their brother-in-law Cyril Ramaphosa, and so on. It wanted to create the space for the new black capitalists. And because the state now had control over all of the mineral resources in the ground, it had the power to hand out the new licenses to sometimes take them away from the white mining companies and to give them to aspirant black capitalists. Or, on the other hand, to insist that the white mining companies had to have at least 26% minimum black share ownership within their companies by a certain date, which is a process which is very contested. And within all of this as well, it also made provisions for rural communities, but they were right at the bottom of the list. And it did say that rural communities must benefit from mining within, within their areas, but actually the mechanisms through which, it would, through which it would do so were generally much weaker than the way in which it was going to promote black capitalists, the Cyrils and the Patri Patrices and so on. So this is really where I want to end up, which I think will, I, I hope will open the room for Hank to come in on the NPRD, on, on, the, on the act itself. Because what I wanted to suggest was that the act itself had contradictory imperatives. It was trying to achieve different things simultaneously. And the question was going to be, where would the greatest weight lay? So could the objectives of rationalization, rationalizing access, promoting growth, and tra transformation, redress and change, be reconciled through the new system? And I'll certainly look at the first one of the measures. If I have time, I'll, I'll look at the second as, as well. So, when it came to communities and how were they going to benefit from the new mining arrangements, the new dispensation, on the one hand, it was a massive blow for those communities which either already held mineral rights or, under the old regime, or because of the restitution process, the restitution of land may have got those rights because they were historically dispossessed of them under apartheid. Like any other form of mineral owner throughout the country, they lost all those rights and the possibility of getting those rights. So this was an enormous blow. But the ANC at the same time said that those small number of communities, particularly those in the northwest province, like the Buffer King, uh, Bajate, Bajafela, Bapo, Bamakale, and others, which had got rights and, and were already receiving a royalty from mining, Although they would use the, lose the mineral rights, they could continue to receive the royalty which they were previously being paid. But now that royalty would be subject to new conditions, new kinds of regulation. And actually, I think in a progressive way, because what the, reg, what the, what the legislation said in, in the transitional arrangements, schedule, schedule 2, item 11, was that they could keep on receiving that royalty if it was used for purposes of development, developing the community. And the tribal authority which was receiving it would need to show to the state that that's what it was being used for. Now, that could have been good news for the people on the ground who would have benefited from the development, but it was bad news for those chiefs who basically had negotiated good deals with mining companies and actually saw this as a private revenue stream for themselves. Suddenly, this would be subject to public regulation. And so they did a very clever trick where they wanted to get out of being publicly regulated and back into effectively privatizing their economic property and their economic resources. And what they did was they said, OK, well, the other side of the act says you want to promote black economic empowerment. And the mining companies that we have deals with have to hit their target of 26% black share ownership. So we now are going to negotiate with the mining companies to convert the future value of our existing royalties into an equity stake within those mining companies. So we are no longer going to be like landlords who are getting the rent for the use of our minerals, but rather we are going to become part of the capitalists themselves. We are going to get share ownership in there. So we won't get rent anymore. We'll get, we'll get dividends instead. And it was the Buffer King which led the way. Um, particularly with their big royalty to equity conversion in 2007, where they became the, sec the, the largest single shareholder in Impala, which is the world's second largest platinum mining company, 
they converted their robot into a 13.4% share. Then what they did was they put all of that money, all of those assets, those shares, and their other mining assets into a holding company, which eventually became known as Royal Buffer King Resources. And then they used that holding company to become an investment vehicle for investing in other sectors, buying shares in other areas, and sectors as diverse as telecoms and construction and banking and everything else, and basically built up a massive BEE business empire which, according to their 2014 an annual report, has a portfolio value of 41.2 billion rand, <coughs> which is staggering. And you can see then there's actually a disassociation between them making money as a landlord now and them making money as a kind of standard corporate or capitalist concern. Now, they said that they were doing this because they wanted to become, quote, the world's leading community-based investment company. In other words, that the money that they would make through Royal Buffer King Holdings would then be reinvested back into the Buffer King community for purposes of development. But remember, all of this was now happening outside of the ambit of the state. They, it was a private arrangement between them and the mining companies and all their other investments, and how much money they decided to put back into the community was entirely up to them. So in other words, the state had lost control of the process of development within the Buffer King area. And the Buffer King were all the time building up to become a mini state, I mean, a, a municipality within a muni municipality. Um, and what I want to suggest was actually this had two results. Maybe I should end here, Rick, before going, um, you know, we could look at other examples, but I don't want to take more time. Sure. So, so, so what I want to suggest was actually this kind of trajectory this kind of conversion of, of chiefs from a kind of landlord into a kind of capitalist in the name of the tribe, in the name of the Marafi, in the name of the people as a whole, has actually had two kind of effects. The first effect is that what it's done is that it has now aligned the interest of the tribal authority with the interest of the mining company because they are part of, more or less part of the same thing. Before, you had the mining company here, and you had the chief as the landowner there, and they were fighting over access and over the amount of rent. Now, the tribal authority is part of the mining company, and they share an interest in the most rapid expansion possible of that mining company over the mineral-rich tribal land. And indeed, in 2008, the Buffer King Tribal Authority applied to the Northwest High Court in Mabatu to stop the state from having any control over its land whatsoever in its historic role as a trustee with an interest in the rights of everybody there, citing in their papers that they no longer wanted to be subject to, quote, the cumbersome procedures which they had to go through when moving into new mining and other commercial contracts. And those cumbersome procedures were actually the duty which was on the Minister of Rural Development and Land Affairs to ensure that any new mining deals over this land benefited all of the people within the area and were done with the consent of all rights holders. So in a way, what's happening is through this, that the chieftaincy is becoming part of the mining company, but also creating that big solid block of land, um, getting rid of all the other rights across which it can quickly move. So this actually is about the elimination of landed property, the barrier of private land ownership, small land ownership at that scale. So that's the first point. And, and it's important to note, sorry, that that process has been strongly resisted by the people who said we bought the land in the first place. Some of them <coughs> may be here. The matter was in court last week. So that's the first point. The second point is that when we look at the behaviour of this organisation, of this entity, this corporate entity called Royal Buffer King Holdings itself, which says, we make money for the people. Well, according to a sympathetic financial expert who was writing an, an opinion in the back of an academic article, which was broadly in support, what he had to say about it from his examination of, of all the figures and everything was he said, Royal Buffer King Holdings' mandate of maximising returns is clearly a profit motive and its ownership structure is designed to consolidate decision making. 
it is very co it is very closely controlled by the chief and um, and the citizens of the Royal Baptist Nation are not its owners. Rather, they at best only have indirect influence in the use of its dividends and almost no say in the governance of the corporation. So basically what it's saying is that this now is operating like any other capitalist com company. Its imperative is to maximise profit. Every time that it gives money to the community to investment in community services, that's a drain on profit. That money could be used in reinvesting and buying other shareholdings elsewhere. So really then there's a huge structural contradiction has emerged in how far you can use a private company to service the interests of the community. So that's the first point, the profit motive dominates. But the second is who decides? Who makes the decisions about where it invests and how much goes to the community? Well, what it's saying here is the structures of decision-making of control have been fashioned in such a way that there's one person who decides effectively, and that person is Corsi, who is chair of the company, who is chair of the Royal Buffeting Nation Development Trust, who is chair of the Royal Buffeting Council, and so on. In other words, which is controlling the relationship between these different institutions. So if I just zoom back through to, to, to finish off, and, and this is really the really the, the, the concluding point. If I come back to this notice, which was erected around the time that Royal Buffer King Holdings was, um, was, was really getting off the ground, when it says this area is designated for mining use, now who is the mining company? Well, actually, the tribal authority in part is the mining company. And who are the squatters who are not allowed to on this point? Actually, it's the members of the community themselves. I'll leave it there. Yeah.